I was speaking in Nicaragua some while back, been there a few times, and uh, and the guy that was translating for me was, uh, and I speak some Spanish, I do fairly well, but not fast enough to preach in it. I mean, I can't think that fast. I have to translate in my head. Robinson, you understand that. And uh, Sable doesn't have to do that. She can think in English, and uh, which is really amazing. But Robinson, even now, of course, he's been speaking English a long, long time. But sometimes you may have to think in Urdu and translate into English. And it's hard to preach that way. It is. He's translated for me before, uh, gosh, a long time ago now. And he was able to do it when I was in Pakistan. But um, anyway, I made the statement, Christ gave his life to you. And the guy that was translating was a very good guy. He was actually born in Nicaragua, and he was he's lived in the United States a long time, and he was an investment guy, and he made a lot of money, and he'd spent tons of money building buildings and, and ministering to pastors, and he was a great guy, a great guy. But he didn't understand the message. And when I said, Christ has given his life to you, he stuttered. I could see him. He said, Christ gave his life for you in Spanish. I said, nope, that's not what I said. I said, Christ has given his life to you. And he thought about it and he said, Christ has given his life for you. And see, that one little word's a big deal. Does that mean that everybody's believed? No, it doesn't. Does that mean everybody's a Christian? No, it doesn't. But I'm telling you what Christ did, what God the Father did, what God the Spirit has done, was done not only for all men, but it was finished before any of you were born. Because anybody here born the day Jesus was crucified? Anybody? I don't think so. Well, he said, it is finished there on the cross. He also said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And that was what we call an aorist imperative. It was a command. And it was a passive voice. I mean, someone else was going to cause the action. You have nothing to do with your forgiveness. Nothing. You were forgiven from the cross. But it even gets better than that because, you see, the cross, even though it was fleshed out in time, it's eternal. So the cross applied to Adam, to you, and to your unborn grandchildren equally. When God created Adam and Eve... He breathed life into them. Did he? That's what it says. He created them from the dust of the earth, and then he did this. <sighs> he breathed spirit. The word is pneuma, life. He breathed life into Adam and Eve. Whose life did, or to Adam, and then Eve was created out of Adam. Whose life did he breathe into Adam? His own, His own life. That's exactly right. He did not do that for the animals. The animal, animals were alive. The plants were alive. But Adam and Eve had life breathed into them. He did not mention that about the animals. And then Adam and Eve sinned. You know the story. And then they separated themselves from God. Does sin lead to separation? It does. But on whose part? It was on Adam and Eve's part. You see... Yahweh, I am that I am, who was in the Old Testament. By the way, Jesus said before Abraham was born, I am. So you see, the pre-incarnate Christ is who we're talking about right here. Yahweh, I am that I am, the one that met with Moses, the one that wrestled with Jacob, the one that was involved in making a covenant on behalf of man, but it was a covenant between God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And Abram saw it. Abram was put into a sleep, but he could still see it. And the, the triune Godhead cut a covenant with each other. And we benefited from it. And it says in the book of Hebrews, it calls that a will. A will. And when does a will go into effect? When there's a death. That's right. Whose death? It's the death of Christ. Christ died, and what happened when Christ died? He who knew no sin became sin so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. There was an exchange. We call it the exchange life. That's what I call it. You see, 
my sin was taken on Christ. He became sin. And then his righteousness became mine. You say, that happened at the cross. Yes, it did. But understand this. You see, the cross is eternal. And God shows us before anything existed in God's mind. This was already finished. Because he chose you before the foundation of the world. And that's in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4. And in verse 5, it, the last part of verse 4 and verse 5, it says, In love he predestined you to adoptions as sons. Isn't that amazing? And when we say son, we're not just talking about boys. We're talking about mankind. In Colossians uh, 3.12, it said so. Paul must have been from South Georgia. He said, so you have been chosen. God's will, not yours. You have been chosen. And then he says, holy. You see, holiness is a position. It is not an action. We think holiness is what you do. It's not. It's a position. The word holy, it's the same word that means set apart. It's the same word we get the word saint from. You were chosen. When were you chosen? According to Ephesians 1.4, before the foundation of the world, you were chosen. <laughs> That's good news. And you were chosen, and then he says, holy, set apart from before the foundation of the world. And then it says, beloved. Now, I'm going to stop after this word, but that word, when I was in my book, I wrote a chapter on basically that word. Beloved. So, you've been chosen, holy, beloved. And I was reading that, and I knew that was something big. And the Lord said to my heart he said read it slow and i did chosen holy beloved and he said read it slower chosen holy be loved and then i read it and i said lord i see you've been chosen holy set apart you ready for this to be loved. You see, we were set apart not for what we could do for God. He doesn't need anything. It says in Acts chapter 17, verse 25, 24 and 25, as if he needed anything with our human hands. We are not the only hands he has on this earth. I've heard that and I've said it, and it's really stupid. The God that spoke the universe into existence needs my hands. How crazy is that? But we've been chosen. To be loved by him. When my children were born, I, I didn't think at that point that they could help Johnny with the dishes and me with the yard work. Wasn't in my mind. Now, later on, I thought, you know, that's not a bad idea. <laughs> but then I didn't think that. All I wanted to do was love them. And then the grandchildren started being born. There are a lot of them. We have 13. In fact, two of them are being baptized today, and my wife is up in Warner Robins, Georgia, about 90 miles from here, 100 miles from here. And uh, she's up there with them. Because we're not going to be meeting next week. We're going to be celebrating with our family at my mother's house on Christmas Eve. So we're not meeting next week. I'll put a message up, but we won't be meeting live. But when Adam and Eve separated themselves from God, from God's perspective, their identity never changed. From their perspective, their identity changed greatly. The Bible says, the day you eat from this tree, you shall surely die. And they did. But did they die physically? No. Some people say, well, they died spiritually. Really? Really? Did they have anything to do with God breathing their, his life into them? Nope. Some of you believe, well, he withdrew his life from them. I want to say again, really? Let's look at the actions. I hadn't planned any of this, what I'm sharing with you now, but I believe it's important. You see, Adam and Eve sinned, disobeyed, and how did they sin? Here's what they did. They believed a lie from Satan that they had to do something to be like God. You say, what's so bad about that? Believed a lie. 
If you believe that anything that you do, pray in the prayer, do it all the right things. If you believe that anything you do has anything to do with your relationship with God, now I'm going to talk about that, then you you believe the lie. Now, from your perspective, does it have something to do with your relationship with God? Absolutely. I can remember when I disobeyed my parents. I remember we had chores to do. Did y'all have chores? The kids still have chores to do. Before they, Mother and dad were gone, and I had to have some stuff done before they got home. And I heard them driving up. None of it was done. I thought, oh, my goodness. I'm in big trouble. Used to, kids got in trouble for not doing what their parents said. Remember those days? And so I thought, I know what I'll do. I'll get in my bed and pretend like I fell asleep. And I woke up and I said, what time is it? And, you know, my mother and dad were a whole lot smarter than me. They didn't believe a word of it. I still got in trouble. I separated myself from them. Now, they still love me. That doesn't mean they didn't discipline me. By the way, the word discipline, what does that sound like, discipline? It sounds like disciple, doesn't it? Yeah. That's what they did. They discipled me. <laughs> I didn't like it. Alan, you've been discipled a time or two. We've got the king of the disciples here. I just, I know stuff about him and I can't, I can't help but laugh. Alan makes me feel, I mean, he makes me, you know, appear smart when I was a kid. And that's hard to do, Alan. I mean, uh, I won't say. Uh, God lives, he I, know, I know he lived, so I know God. I know your mom and daddy love you because you're still alive. <laughs> yeah, they loved him a lot. They discipled him a lot, too. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, all that I just shared with you is free. Here's the last part I was, from going back to the garden. Adam and Eve hid from God because they saw themselves as what they thought they were, naked. And, you know, the Bible just said they were created naked without shame. But when they saw themselves naked, they hid from God. They separated themselves from God. The word dead, is it, it means literally to be separate, to be separated. And that's what they did. They died to the fact that they were alive in God through Christ. But you see, Yahweh, I am that I am, the pre-incarnate Christ, when Adam and Eve hid from him, he sought them. You see, going back again, your relationship to God is determined by Him, not by you. You say, but when we sin, yeah. You see, when you sin, now you believe a lie. You think God loves you or saves you based on what you do rather than what He did from eternity past. And then He showed them. After He sought them and found them, he did something that had never happened up until this point. He shed the blood of an innocent animal and made skin coverings for Adam and Eve. Say, what is the point of that? Why is that in the Bible? It's a picture of the cross. That's the first picture of the cross in the, in the uh, Old Testament, New Testament, in the Bible. And it's a picture of the blood sacrifice. And he wasn't doing it so he, he wasn't doing that so that God the Father would have to punish somebody and it's going to either be Jesus or you, which is what some of you believe, but that wasn't it at all. It was restorative. You see, the pre-incarnate Christ was making a point with Adam and Eve. He was restoring, listen, what they thought they had lost. They didn't understand all of this. You understand more than they did. But... It was a picture of the cross where he who knew no sin became sin so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Well, that started before Christ was born. I'm just going to read to you a little bit and we're going to go quickly. All that I just shared with you is free, okay? It wasn't planned. But I'm going to leave it in. I thought I might edit it out, but I'm not. In Luke chapter 1, by the way, Dr. Luke wrote this. Dr. Luke learned this from Paul. Paul learned it from Jesus. You say, wait a minute. Paul wasn't with Jesus. Yes, he was. I believe Paul was alone with Jesus for three years in a desert before he started doing anything. 
Dr. Luke wrote chronologically. He wrote it in the order it happened. It's the only one of the Gospels that's written that way. Dr. Luke also wrote the book of Acts. It's written chronologically. But here we are in Luke chapter 1, verse 26. And now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to the city of Galilee called Nazareth to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the descendants of David and the and the virgin's name was Mary. And coming in, he said to her, and I like this, Gabriel, the angel Gabriel, here's what he told her, greetings, favored one, greetings, favored one. You say, yeah, Mary was favored. Now, we're not going to go like the Catholics here and say Mary was the mother of God. She was. But we don't pray to Mary and we don't worship Mary. She was a woman, just like some of you are women. She wasn't without sin. People say she was without sin. That's what the Catholics taught. I'm telling you, it's wrong. But what she was, was favored by God. You say, ah, oh, yes, that sets her apart. Nope, not even that. Because you see, we're going to see that you are also favored by God. Now, why did God choose Mary? I don't know. But he did. She was a young girl, a young teenage girl. Greetings, favored one. Then he said this, the Lord with you. In the English, they added the word is, the Lord with you. You say, yes, look, God was with her. Good news, folks. God is with you too. In verse 29, but she was very perplexed at this statement. She didn't understand. And tragically, you don't either sometimes. I don't either sometimes. And she kept pondering what kind of situation this was. Now, let me ask you. You know, there's some big time angels, Gabriel being one of them, Michael being another one. And then we talk about the angel of the Lord. But Gabriel is the one talking to her here. How would you feel if Gabriel showed up to you and started telling you things that were impossible? You would think you'd lost your mind. They'd put you, if you were in New York, they'd put you in Bellevue. Bellevue, my, I, I used to be a member of Bellevue Baptist Church. Adrian Rogers was my pastor. I loved him and he loved me. But it was a different thing. Bellevue is the hospital in New York where if you see stuff like this, that's where they send you. Except she believed him. The angel said to her, look at this, do not be afraid. And he would have to tell you that too, because you'd be afraid, so would I. Mary, for you have found favor with God. Second time he said it. Second time. And I can say again, so have you. Verse 31, big, big verse. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall name him Jesus. The word Jesus, that's the same name y'all named Yahshua. Or Ye it's per they spell it Yeshua, but they say Yahshua, except for his mama when she goes, Yeshua, when she's calling him. When he's in trouble. They say, hey, that dear boy doesn't get in trouble. He's a boy. Sable, she's smiling big right now. She knows. But you'll name him Jesus. It's the word we get the word uh, Joshua from. In Mexico or in the Spanish-speaking countries, they name their children Jesus. Spelled exactly the same way Jesus. And I've heard, heard people say, that's sacrilegious. And I say, no, it's not. It's no different than naming him Joshua or Yeshua. It's the same. But it means Savior. And they knew what his name was going to be before he was born. And then in verse 32, and this comes directly from Isaiah 9, and I preached on Isaiah 9 earlier this two weeks ago. And he will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David. Now, I want you to see something. He was of the, the lineage of David. And some of you may be saying now, well, we know that Joseph was of the lineage of David, but Joseph wasn't his physical father. Well, here's the good news. 
Mary was also of the lineage of David. And he will be given the throne of his father David. It talks about this in Acts 2. It talks about this in Isaiah. It talks about it all over the Old Testament. You know, I told you last week that there were at least 130 prophecies in the Old Testament of the birth of Christ. Right down to the town he was going to be born in. Right down to where he was moved. Right down to the fact that he went into Egypt. And the Bible says out of Egypt he came. Right down to his name, 130 different prophecies, and every one of them was, was right. And the odds of that, and I told you last week, and I actually tried to multiply it out with present-day calculators, which have no end. And 130 to the 130th power, that would be 130 times 130 times 130 times 130, and we call this probability. And I, was, I made an A in probability. Statistics, quantitative analysis. I was really good in math. I knew I couldn't figure it out. But then it came up and it basically said, I even used AI to try to do it. And AI came back and he said, you may be crazy, but I'm not. We can't figure that big. The number is so big, it cannot be calculated. And that would be that huge number to one that Christ would be born exactly like it says in the Old Testament. But it happened exactly like it said. In verse 33, And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will have no end. The house of Jacob. By the way, the word Jacob, he was the son of Abraham. His name was changed to Israel. And Jacob had 12 sons by a whole bunch of different women. And they became the 12 tribes of Israel. And he said he will reign over his house. Jacob was the son of Abraham. When the covenant was made between God the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And Abram, his name was changed to Abraham. And you know, it's really cool. In the Hebrew... You know, I didn't really enjoy Hebrew like I did Greek when I was studying it. Looking back, I'm really grateful I had it. Do you know how you make something plural in Hebrew? It's really simple. In the English and the Spanish, you add an S. In the, Span in the Romance languages, basically, you add an S. In Hebrew, which is not a Romance language, you add this sound. Hmm. That makes it plural. Abram's name was Abram. And when he came into this relation with God, through the act of God, not the act of Abram, he changed his name to Abraham. There's no vowel. We say Abraham. We have to because we have to have a vowel. In the, in the Hebrew, they don't have vowels. So the hmm, it's a, little, it's a little apostrophe with a little box that looks like it's got an antenna on the left side of the top of the box. And that hmm means more than one. You So Abram, when his name was changed to Abram, he was basically telling him, you're not alone. There's more to you than what people see. You see, it's the same with you. Your name could be Andrew in the Hebrew. Isn't that cool? The Spirit lives in you. In verse 34, Mary said to the angel, and this is an understatement. She said, how can this be since I am a virgin? And the angel answered and said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. And for that reason, the Holy Child shall be called the Son of God. The Son of God. Fully man, fully God. Before the before the birth of Christ, before God became man. You see, Messiah in the form of, well, the, the second person of the Godhead, the Son of God, existed. But you see, Christ in time became Jesus. The word Christ, it's, it's the word in the Hebrew, it would be Messiah, which means Messiah. Christos is the Greek word. And when he was born, of woman, literally God became man, 
fully God and fully man. And he exists that way today. In eternity, he is still the God-man. Verse 36, And behold, even your relative Elizabeth has also conceived a son in her old age, and she who was called barren is now in her sixth month. By the way, Elizabeth conceived and was going to bear John the Baptist, who was Jesus' cousin. Verse 37, For nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, and this is a great word, the bond slave of the Lord, may it be done to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. There's another thing here I'm going to say. Mary believed the angel. You could say that a different way. Mary believed God. Mary believed God. She said, Behold the bond slave, and she's talking about herself. And the word for that is soon doulos. Doulos is the word for slave. Soon makes it be a slave with or a slave by choice. She was a free woman, but she chose to place herself under Christ. The word doulos, it's translated servant. Now, do you serve? Do you serve? Yes. Is that your identity? Say, I just want to be a servant of God. Well, you don't understand. Because, you see, the Bible says you are no longer a doulos, a slave. But you are a son. Now, do sons serve? You see, a son is a son. But a son can also be a soon doulos, a bond slave. In other words, he's serving the father, not because he has to for his identity, but he's serving the father out of choice. Because he loves the Father, and the Father loves him, and that's his choice. And that's who you are. Will you serve? Yes. Are you a servant with by identity? No. You are a child of God. And it seems like it might be a play on words, but it is not. Will a child of God serve? Good example is Jesus. He was the greatest servant of all, and yet he was fully God, along with being fully man. And that's what she did. She believed, and then the angel departed. In verse 39, Now at that time Mary arose and went in a hurry to the hill country, to the city of Judah. Now, and entered the house of Zacharias and greeted Elizabeth. And I'm going to stop after I read this next verse. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. You see, the preborn child, which is what John was, heard Mary and he recognized the preborn Jesus in Mary and he leaped for joy in his mother's womb. That's unreal. I don't even begin to understand that. I just believe it. I just believe it. Flip over to chapter 2 in Luke 2 and we're going to look at Jesus' birth in Bethlehem. Now in those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that a census be taken of all the inhabited earth. This was the first census taken while uh, Quirinius was governor of Syria. And everyone was on his way to register for the census, each to his own city. Joseph also went up from Galilee. Now, this is really funny because when you go to Jerusalem, no matter where you are, you say, I'm going up to Jerusalem. Galilee, here's Jerusalem down here. Galilee's up here. And in the middle is Judah. I'm sorry, Samaria. In the middle is Samaria. And the Jews would go around Samaria and go out of their way because they didn't go through Samaria because they were half-breeds. They were half-Jew and half-Gentile. Oh, and they were looked down on. We look down on people. And it's just as wrong now as it was then. But it's a big trip to go from Galilee all the way down to Jerusalem. But they say he went up to Jerusalem. Joseph went up from Galilee, from the city of Nazareth. Nazareth, Capernaum would be right here and Nazareth would be right here. They were close together as the crow flies, but even then that was a good little walk. Capernaum's where Peter lived. A lot of things went on in Capernaum with Jesus. In the city of Nazareth to Judea, 
to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and the family of David. Now, Bethlehem's right outside the outskirts of Jerusalem. Bethlehem is still a town. You know, at one time, Bethlehem was filled with Christians. Now there are almost none. They've been basically chastised and threatened and killed, and, and they just left. But there's still a church in Bethlehem, and I've been to it, that was built by, um, I just got a message from CVS Pharmacy. I'm sure y'all are glad, but, but anyway, I just got one. Anyway, uh, and they built this church. Constantine's mother-in-law built it in 300 A.D. And you know the great part about that? It's, it's, in, it's inhabited by eastern orthodox to this day probably the most accurate of all the christian quote-unquote religions would be eastern orthodox right down to the time that they celebrate christmas not on the same day that we do but it doesn't matter we just know it wasn't december 25th they celebrated on january 6th and it might not have been january 6th doesn't matter but what does matter you know they built this church over the cave in which jesus was born we're going to see about that Joseph, uh, let me see, it's, I found my spot. Verse 6. No, let me go back to verse 4. Joseph also went up from Galilee to the city of Judea. Okay, in verse 5. In order to register along with Mary, who was engaged to him and was with child. While they were there, the days were completed for her to give birth. Now, let me say, if you go to the book of Matthew, you see that Joseph being a righteous man, the Bible says... He realized Mary was pregnant, and you can't hide that for very long. And he knew it wasn't him. And so nobody had ever been born of a virgin before. And so he didn't believe that she'd never known a man till the angel showed up and told him. And Joseph believed the angel. And so at first he was going to put her apart away. He was going to issue her a certificate of divorce because with the Jewish culture, you were married from the time of, of a spousal, which could be as babies. And the angel said, don't do it. The father is the spirit. He's going to have a baby. He's going to be the son of God. Gave him his name. He said, you're going to call him Emmanuel, which is another name. While they were there, they went to the, it says in another place that there was no room in the inn. You've heard that, and it's true. And so I can just see it now. They said, uh, well, there's no room in the inn, but if you want to, at least you can stay warm. You can stay in the stable, which would be behind the inn, and it was a, like a cave-like thing. You can stay there. And I can just picture, can you picture this? And I, I know Jewish women, and I've been to Israel, and, and, and I'm sure they were concerned about this young, soon-to-be mother who could give birth at any time. Can you just imagine those ladies trying to look after Mary? We have the idea that Mary and Joseph were totally on their own. You know, I always thought that, but the Bible doesn't say that. There could have been people that came in to help because the Bible says the baby was wrapped in swaddling clothes, or it says that in the King James in, in the NIV and the in New American Standard. It just says clothes. But, you know, that word means literally the stuff that you wrap babies in. I wonder, where'd that come from? You think they brought it with them? Maybe they did. It doesn't really matter. We just know it happened. And it was time for her to give birth. And in verse 7, big verse, and she gave birth to her firstborn son. There are those, and I'm not putting anybody down, but the Catholics believe that there were no other children, that Mary had no other children, and yet the Bible tells us over and over that she did. One of them was James. He was the pastor of the church in Jerusalem. And it says here, her firstborn son. Why would it say firstborn son? Because she had others. And she wrapped him in clothes, and that word is swaddling clothes, and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Verse 8. Now this is big. In the same region, there were some shepherds staying out in the fields and keeping watch over their flock by night. Let me stop. To this day, this church, the oldest known church in existence that's operated from the time it was built till present time, is still there. Across the street 
from this church in a valley. There to this day, there are sheep with shepherds looking after those sheep right there in Bethlehem to this day. They were there then. But God sent angels, a heavenly choir, to tell the shepherd, why in the world would he pick shepherds? You know what? The Bible says this. God has used, used the base things of this world to confound the wise. He could have spoken to Herod. We talked about Herod last week, but he didn't. He didn't. He spoke to shepherds right here. In the same region, there were some shepherds staying out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord suddenly stood before them. And the glory of the Lord shone round, around them, and they were terribly frightened. Can you imagine the angel of the Lord? Could it have been Michael? Could have been. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid. Do you see how many times when you have an encounter with heavenly bodies? I believe today we're seeing people that are having encounters with Christ Literally through dreams or visions, you say that doesn't say that in the Bible. I'm just telling you what's happening in Iran, the fastest growing country in the world for Christendom today. All the fastest growing countries pretty much are in the Middle East with the exception of China. And we're seeing this with some of the Palestinian Hamas people that are having visions now. And Christ is revealing himself to them through dreams Folks, he did this kind of thing back then. And we say, yes, but he doesn't do that now. The audacity of people telling God what he can and cannot do. He said, I didn't write this. He said, if there was nobody there, he would cause the very rocks to cry out. Those aren't my words. He says, do not be afraid for behold, I bring you. Look at these next two words. Good news. You know what the word gospel means? Good news. So he could have said here, and he is saying here, it's the same word, for behold, I bring you gospel of great joy, which will be for, oh my goodness, what is that next word? All the people. Ho, ho, ho. Here we go. What and who is the gospel for? Tell me. Say it. All the people. Do you believe that? Yes. Oh, I think what he meant to say, he's bringing you good news, this gospel of joy of those that have read the Bible and pray the prayer. Is that what this says? No. Anything wrong with reading the Bible? No. Anything wrong with praying? No. But I'm telling you, God is the one who seeks men and not the other way. You say, oh, there have been people that have sought God. Yes, they did after the Spirit was drawing them to Himself. I'm telling you, it's all about the love of God toward man. Do you love Him? Absolutely. Should you love Him? Yes. And the Bible has something to say about that. He said, we love Him because He first loved us. We call this good news. The death, the burial, and the resurrection. This is good news. Christ was born, literally, to die. You say, but he gave us a great example while he was alive. Yes, he did. But it's not about his example. It's about him. He gave us far more than his example. He gave us his life. And in verse 11, now, some people say you ought not to write in your Bible. Well, if that's the case, I'm in big trouble. Because I put three stars by this and underlined it and highlighted stuff. But look, who is this for? All the people, right? Mm -hmm. All right. So this is what I'm about to read you is for all the people. All right. Verse 11. For today in the city of David, there has been born for you. you say he's talking to the shepherds. It's for them. Yes. And it's for you, too is born for you a Savior who is, for the first time, we're saying it this way, born of a woman who is 
Christ the Lord. Messiah and this word Lord, if it was in the Hebrew, it would be the word Adonai. And if it's in the Greek here, it means owner ruler, who is the Messiah owner ruler. This is the incarnation. This is the incarnation. When God became man, verse 12, and this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in clothes and lying in a manger. And this word wrapped, it means having been wrapped. It's a participle and it's a passive voice. Somebody else did the wrapping. You see, the same God that created the earth, Yahweh, is the same God that literally couldn't change his own diaper or couldn't wrap himself to stay warm when he was born. And it's a perfect tense verb, and that means it took place at a point in time and the results are ongoing. You see, the Christ child, who is literally God, needed somebody to look after him. I don't understand. Why would God do that? But he did. And this will be a sign for you. I just read that in verse 13. And suddenly there appeared with the angel, with the single angel, a multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory in the highest and on earth peace among men with whom he is pleased. You see, the angels had been waiting for eternity, for this specific period of time see angels they were not bound by time but they got to step from eternity into time so that they could sing the doxology praise god from whom all blessings flow the angels they couldn't help themselves i can just see it. it's, it's like the father said okay go and they jumped into eternity and started singing Praising God, praising God. And then he reads, which the Old Testament. And then he says, and it finishes it up. And on earth, peace among men. Then he says this, with whom he is well pleased. Now, folks, we could say, yeah, but he's not pleased with people today. Today, the world's really bad. Really? Really? Really bad today. Oh, they're doing bad things today. Really? Have you studied much up on Rome, what they were doing? Have you studied much up on King Herod, who killed all of his family? He killed his wife. Anybody that he deemed a threat, he killed them. He was a murdering guy. He was not a good guy. And that was the norm of the day. Wickedness abounded from the beginning. And yet God referred to men with whom he is well pleased. Is he pleased with sin? No. Why? Because sin harms those that he loves. But you see, the nature of God is not dependent on what man does or does not do. In verse 15, when the angels had gone away from them into the heaven, the shepherds began saying to one another, this is big. Let us go straight to Bethlehem then and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. Now the Lord made known something to the shepherds, didn't he? He spoke to them. What did they do? They acted on it. What's something they did before they acted on it? I'm looking for a specific thing or word. They believed him. They believed him. No one acts on what they don't believe. You see, God spoke to their heart through the angels. And they believed. Who they believed? The angels? Or do they believe God? They believed God. You see, we don't know who's going to believe and who's not going to believe. The things that the angels told the shepherds, those are the same things that we're to tell men. We tell them, God became man, and he was born of a virgin and lived a perfect life. And he went to the cross, and he became sin, and he died, and he was buried. And when one died, all died, it says in 2 Corinthians 5, 14. And when he died, I died. 
And when he was buried, I was buried. And when he was raised to walk in newness of life, I was raised to walk in newness of life. And so were you. So will you believe him? Will you believe that you are called son? Will you believe that you're loved by God? Will you allow him to rule and reign? Because the word Lord here is the word Adonai, owner, ruler. Will you believe that he will rule and reign in your heart? Will you believe that he has given you his nature? What is the nature of God? Love. God is love. Verse 16. So they came in a hurry and found their way to Mary and Joseph and the baby as he lay in the manger. Now look at this, verse 17. When they had seen this, they made known the statement which had been told to them about this child. They told Mary and Joseph. Now look at this next word. This is why I think there were some other people there other than Mary and Joseph. Listen. I bet you hadn't seen this before. Look. And all who heard it wondered. Can you just see it from that end? The mamas, the ladies that were down there helping Mary. You would do that, wouldn't you? All who heard it wondered at the things which they were told them by the shepherds. There were probably people from the inn that were in the cave there. Have you ever seen that before? Answer me. Have you ever seen that before? It's been there since they wrote it. But Mary treasured all these things, pondering them in her heart. And then verse 20, the shepherds went back glorifying and praising God for all that they had heard and seen just as had been told them. <laughs> it says that they glorifying and praising all that they'd seen and heard they not only heard it and believed it, but then there was one other thing that they did. They saw it for themselves. You see, that's how it works with us too. We hear it. And then we believe it. And then we see it. Our eyes are opened. And we go away rejoicing, pondering. Do you think these were the only folks the shepherds told about this? When they got back to the village wherever they lived, don't you imagine they sold their, told their wives, told their children, told grandma and grandpa, told the people that worked at the stable, told the blacksmith, told the feed store guys, you know, told the folks down at the post office, can you all imagine? Told the folks checking out people at the grocery store. They told everybody. Couldn't keep it quiet. Couldn't keep it quiet. Well, in verse 21, I'm not going to read it. I just going to tell you about it. It came time in the eighth day, circumcised on the eighth day, came time to go to the temple, and they did. And it says in verse 23, every firstborn male that opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord. Okay, that's not what I was going to share. Anyway, they get to the temple, and there's somebody that had been waiting for a long, long time to see this happen. He was looking for this one. And there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And this man was righteous and devout, looking for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Spirit was upon him. The Spirit of God had revealed to this man about the upcoming birth of the Messiah. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And when you see the word Christ, the word is Messiah. And some people were thinking about this from a religious and a political view. They thought the Messiah was going to be the one that was going to come in and overthrow the Romans. But they were talking about the Messiah before the Romans even existed as a country. And then we do the same thing here. We want to politicize everything, and it's not. And he came in the Spirit into the temple. The Spirit of God directed him into the temple. And when the parents brought the child Jesus to carry out for him the custom of the law, then he took him into his arms. Can you see this old man walking up to Mary and Joseph, holding out his arms? Give me the baby. And they didn't know him. But they handed the baby to him. And he took him in his arms 
and blessed God and said, look at this, verse 29 through 32, and then we're done. Now, Lord, you are releasing your bondservant. There's that word again. Soon do loss. You're releasing your bondservant to depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation. Let me stop. Your eyes have seen your salvation. For you have prepared in the presence of all peoples. Ooh, what's that word again? All, all what? Peoples. He said peoples. You could say persons. A light for the revelation to, look at this next word, the Gentiles. Notice he doesn't say Jews. What's significant about this? Because you see, the Jews were a group that had taken themselves out. And the Jews were going to be a blessing to all the nations. You know the word nations is the word we use, the word Gentiles. And so here he skipped that thing. Jesus is the seed of Abraham. And he, through the Jews, was born and became a blessing to all the nations, the Gentiles. But this word Gentiles, it literally, the primary meaning for this is family of man. So let me read this. A light of revelation to the family of man and the glory of your people, Israel. So he said all peoples. He's talking about all the family of man, the Gentiles, the nations, and to Israel. So let me ask you a question. Who's left out of this blessing? Nobody. What about the Muslims? Nope, they're not left out. Do they need to trust Christ? Yes, they do. Do they need to believe him? Yes, they do. Is there wickedness in the world? There's always been wickedness. But does he love them? Did he die for them? Yes. Did he take on their sin? Yes. Folks, this is so much bigger than we can fathom on this side. The angels understood they understood and they might have thought, I can't believe he's doing this. But he did. So I wish you a Merry Christmas. Watch this message again. Share this with people. You tell them what he did that day when God became man, lived a perfect life without sin and died and was buried and was raised and when he died on that cross so did you and he was buried so were you people have not believed it tell them tell them it's true tell them it applies to them ask them to believe it but they're not believing so that god will do something they're believing because god has done something and they're believing in what he has already done not what he will do big difference I love you guys. You think about this, and we'll see you next time. Merry Christmas.